Okay, we're back. And for today's lecture, we have Dr. Stephen Backus, who is a professor in neurobiology, and he's going to give us an introduction to neurophysiology. Take it away, Steve. Thanks, Kim. So this lecture is, as Kim says, is about in an introduction to neurophysiology, the basic mechanisms that make the nervous system work. Because this is an ultrasound class, I'm going to be pausing it a few times to talk about you know, how ultrasound might interact in different ways with the mechanisms that I'm going to be talking about. So this will be a, an introductory, a basic lecture. I'll be talking about membrane properties, resting potential, action potentials, and synaptic transmission. And I'm going to begin by mentioning just uh, the main parts of uh, the nervous system, which uh, are two types of cells, and the first are neurons. So neurons are the basic cells that carry the primary signals that process and store information and transmit information. So neurons are composed of uh, dendrites where they receive synaptic input. The synaptic is integrated or sums together. Uh, the signals are added together in the region of the soma and at that point, a decision is made as to whether or not to produce an electrical signal that's then sent down the axon to the end of the uh, axon terminal. So the places where neurons are joined with each other are called synapses. The presynaptic uh, neuron synapses upon the postsynaptic neuron. Uh, and a uh, electrical signal called an action potential is sent down the axon to the axon terminal and activates synapses to release neurotransmitter. Neurons are combined together in groups called neural circuits that can be quite complex. Neurons can excite or inhibit each other. And we won't talk too much about the details of how neural circuits perform a computation, but these are quite complex and really the study of much of the re research in the nervous system. Neural circuits together are comp composed, um, uh, comprise large, uh, large regions of the brain. So many neural circuits uh, together you might think of as an activity in a brain region, such as might uh, um, subserve functions of vision, audition, motor function, cognition, and learning. Most of this lecture will be focused on these basic mechanisms of neurons and synapses and neural circuits. The other type of cell that I want to make sure and mention in the nervous system is called a glial cell. So there's several types of glial cells and they perform a large variety of functions that are to support uh, uh, the nervous system um, in terms of um, um, various things such as uh, helping uh, neurons to conduct their signals faster in the case of myelin. Uh, in the case of uh, astrocytes, they perform functions such as uh, helping synapses form, helping synapses to be pruned, um, uh, helping the blood-brain barrier uh, maintain its integrity, things like ion buffering and neurotransmitter recycling. Microglial cells are the resident immune cells in the nervous system. They also help in synaptic pruning. So I won't really be talking too much more about these cells, except to say that we know virtually nothing about what are the effects of ultrasound on glial cells. And it's a subject of, uh, of research really that much, much of it has not been, uh, been begun yet. But you can't just consider the effects of ultrasound on, on neurons, one must also consider the effects of ultrasound on glia. Uh, Steve, what, really what's, the, uh, anymore. what's the balance of these non-neuronal cells to the neurons themselves in the brain? Are there just as many or, or just a few? Uh, they would are similar numbers. Uh, I wouldn't be able to say whether they are the same or outnumber neurons, but the same, the same order of magnitude. Yeah, they're just so, as many. So they are important, or yeah. at least there's a lot of them. Yes, and their functions in terms of biology are, are uh, quite extensively studied, both in normal function and disease. Most people tend to focus on neurons because those are the sort of main uh, components that do the computation, send the signals, but glia also perform many important uh, support functions. Okay. But we won't be focusing on them much this lecture. All right, so I'm going to begin by an overview, an intuitive uh, overview of how signals are generated and transmitted in the nervous system. Then afterwards, I'm going, to come, I'm going to come back to a more quantitative treatment of those mechanisms. So this is the membrane of a cell here, and inside and outside of the cell uh, is a solution with conductive ions in it. In this case, there's a, a few more, a little bit more negatively charged ions inside of the cell than outside of the cell. And that means that the inside of a cell has a negative charge, about 60 millivolts or so, negative 60 millivolts or so. We call this the resting potential. 
So if you were to take an electrode and place that electrode outside of a cell to measure the potential difference between the tip of the electrode and the and a reference. So you'd see that outside of the cell it would have about zero millivolts. And once you plunge it into a cell, you'd see this resting potential of about 60 millivolts, ne negative 60 millivolts or so. If you were to take a second electrode and inject it into a cell and inject current, what you'd see is a change in membrane potential of that cell because the membrane of a cell is an, is an electrical resistor. So if you were to pass hyperpolarizing current into the cell, the cell would hyperpolarize here. Depolarizing current would cause the cell to become um, less polarized, called depolarized, becoming uh, closer to zero millivolts. A little more positive current would cause the cell to depolarize more. And then you'd see something special and interesting happened. When this, once the cell reaches a certain threshold, it would create a regenerative potential called an action potential. It suddenly depolarizes more positive than zero and creates this brief spike, as it's also called, that lasts about a millisecond or so that can be sent on to the axon terminal to transmit a signal to another cell. So this action potential is a key way that a that key way that neurons uh, integrate and um, cross a threshold and then effectively make a decision as to whether to pass a signal on to another cell or not. Okay. So the phases of the action potential, I'll go through them here and briefly mention how they're generated. In the membrane are proteins called ion channels that are conductive pores that allow ions to flow in and out. There's a higher concentration outside of the cell uh, than uh, for sodium than inside of the cell, whereas potassium, there's a higher concentration inside of the cell than out. And different ion channels are selective for different types of ions. So here's a diagram of an action potential here. And during this action potential, these, these ion channels undergo different phases of opening and closing. These ion channels sense the depolarization of the membrane. And if the membrane reaches a little bit above threshold, then uh, voltage gated sodium channels will open then and become conductive. And then in that case, sodium ions will flow into the cell. This process is called gating. Once that happens, sodium comes in, which tends to depolarize the cell because it's a positive current coming in. And that basically depolarizes the cell more, which opens more sodium channels, creating a positive feedback loop that rapidly depolarizes the cell above zero millivolts. After a short time, these ion channels, these voltage-gated sodium channels close with a process called inactivation. And then also with the delay, voltage-gated potassium channels open. And because potassium is higher inside of the cell, potassium flows out, and that will hyperpolarize the cell, bringing it down first below baseline. And then once the potassium channels close, because the cell is no longer depolarized, the, the cell membrane will recover to its baseline resting state. So that process of voltage dependent gating is the way that action potentials are uh, created. And we'll talk more in detail about that. Okay, so action potentials are, are not normally triggered by an electrode being plunged into a cell and injected in current. They're normally tri tri uh, triggered by current that flows through synapses. Okay. So here's a diagram of a synapse. When an action potential travels down the axon terminal, it depolarizes the synaptic terminal, as it's called. This depolarization opens a different type of voltage-gated channel called a, a calcium channel. In that case, calcium enters and binds with proteins that cause the fusion of a structure called a synaptic vesicle. So these are little bags of membranes that are filled up with neurotransmitter. And when calcium enters the cell, these synaptic vesicles fuse with the membrane and then release their neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft. This neurotransmitter then diffuses across the membrane, which is a very short distance, about 50 nanometers or so, a similar size to the synaptic vesicle, which are also about 50 nanometers or so. The neurotransmitters then bind to receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. And then depending on the type of receptor, current will flow through that receptor, either depolarizing or hyperpolarizing the postsynaptic cell. And then the postsynaptic Excel will sum all of its signals together and then again decide whether to, to create an action potential or not. Okay, so that's the basic overview of how neurons receive input, how they decide to create uh, a signal, an action potential, a spike or not, and how they send that signal through a synapse onto another cell. So now we're going to dive into the mechanisms of how all those processes are created. So first is going into uh, the, the membrane of a, of a neuron itself, membrane of cells in general itself. 
uh, cell membranes are composed of what's called phospholipids. So these are uh, 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 charged molecules, polar molecules that has a, a hydrophilic head that faces the saline inside and out of the cell and a hydrophobic tail that, that faces each other. So there's a bilayer of, uh, of lipid that makes up the membrane. In the membrane are also proteins. And proteins are, include, include the ones that I just mentioned, ion channels, which conduct uh, ions across the membrane, um, uh, depolarizing or hyperpolarizing the cell. So in terms of the electrical properties, membranes have a resistance that's uh, a high resistance from the lipid, um, lipid bilayer, but also a lowered resistance from the proteins from the ion channels. And another important electrical property is, is the capacitance, okay. which is created by the fact that uh, this, um, the lipid bilayer is a dielectric, and it's also very, very thin in the order of 10 nanometers or so. And the thinness um, from the formula of, uh, of how a dielectric generates a, a, a capacitor, uh, when, the, when the width of the capacitor is very thin, that creates a higher capacitance. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about what's, what's uh, called an equivalent circuit model for a neuron. So if this is a neuron here, we're zooming into the membrane and then we're creating a little electronic circuit that performs basically what the cell does. So this is an approximation, but it's one that's often used to summarize the electrical properties of the cell and lets us understand how it behaves. So in this equivalent circuit, we can measure the voltage across the membrane. We can also inject a current into the neuron here. And as I mentioned, the cell has a capacitance. So just like the capacitance in any electronic circuit, the equation that describes the, um, uh, the relationship of charge to voltage is the ch uh, change in Q is equal to C times change in V. The change in charge, the flow of charge onto the capacitor is equal to the capacitance times the change in voltage. The more charge flows onto the capacitor, the greater the change in voltage. The units of capacitance is, is farads and charge is coulombs and voltage is volts. So what we want to do is figure out if we have this capacitor and we jack some current, what is the time course of the change? What is the time course of the current that's flowing through this capacitor? We can take this equation, uh, Q is equal to CV and differentiate it with respect to time, which will give us the current. So the derivative, the time derivative of charge is current. So take the uh, dq dt, that's the current. And we differentiate this term over here. And that gives us c dv dt plus v dc dt. Now, almost every treatment of uh, basic neurophysiology that you see will immediately cross this second term out, this last term out, and say that the capacitance doesn't change, it's constant. And so we can ignore the dc dt. In the case of considering what are the effects of ultrasound stimulation on the nervous system, you have to consider the effect that um, the possibility that capacitance may change. You know, changing the, the shape of the membrane, a pressing on it may change the capacitance. And in fact, it's been shown that this can occur uh, through ultrasound um, delivering radiation force on a lipid membrane that the capacitance can be changed. So that what, what that would mean is that the change in capacitance would create a current that depends on the voltage. So this is a term not really to forget about when you're considering the effects of ultrasound. For the rest of this lecture, however, I will assume that the capacitance is constant and we'll set this term to zero. So what this means is that the current that's flowing on flowing uh, onto this uh, capacitor is going to be equal to C dV dt. So now if we re rearrange this equation because we want to solve what the voltage is, what we get is an equation sh shown here that the voltage is equal to a constant plus one over C times the integral of the current. So what this means is that the capacitance is effectively acting as an integrator. It integrates the, the current flowing through a cell membrane or flowing onto a cell membrane and that uh, will influence the change in voltage. So now this is only considering the effect of the capacitance in, the, in our equivalent circuit. Now let's add in the resistance. So I've added a resistor to this circuit. And so uh, we can think of this as what's called a leak current. So IL, the leak current, and RL is the leak resistance. So these would be created by the proteins that I mentioned before, the ion channels. From Kirchhoff's current law, we know that 
the sum of currents flowing into, the no into any node is the same as the sum of currents flowing out of it. So if we inject current into the cell, that current is going to be this, uh, the sum of the current flowing across the resistor and the current flowing across this capacitor. We've already said what the current flowing onto the capacitor is, that's CDV dt. And so what we want to know is what is this membrane ionic current that sums with the capacitive current to equal the current that we would inject into the cell. So now this leak uh, current, as it's called, uh, we, can, uh, we can know what it is just from Ohm's law. So this is a resistor and, um, and we can take the simple approximation that if this is a voltage across a resistor, the current is going to be um, um, e equal to the voltage divided by that resistance. And we're using the conventions that positive current means leaving the cell and inward current means positive current entering the cell. Sorry, outward current is positive current leaving the cell and inward current is positive current entering the cell, which is negative. Outward current positive, inward current negative. Steve, when you're uh, when you're referring to injecting current, um, you know, if you did it uh, with electrophysiological equipment, would that be similar to something like uh, a cell dumping neurotransmitter onto a neighboring cell, or can you draw some parallels there? Yeah, so that would that would be, and I will get get to that in a minute. What happens when the current doesn't come through an electrode? And that's right. So the current we're putting through an electrode, but it could come through either ion channels or it could come from a synapse opening and current, either inward current. Uh, entering a cell, uh, positive, uh, negative current, or outward current leaving a cell, which is dis, um, designated as positive current. You know, effectively, you'll get the same, the same answer. Although the dynamics of the current are controlled in that case, not by our electrodes, but by either the ion channels or by, um, by synapse. Okay, so this equation describes how the ionic current and capacitive current would sum together. Okay. Now, rearranging this equation a little bit, we'll multiply by this leak resistance here. And so we'll get this term RC times dV dt. Now, looking at this equation, the steady state voltage when dV dt is zero, if we inject a constant current, we can designate as this term here, uh, V infinity. So that would just be the leak resistant times this injected current. And we can rewrite this equation taking RC to be equal to, this uh, to uh, what's called a time constant tau. Okay? So tau effectively scales dV dt over time. We can solve this equation when uh, um, the injected current is constant, and then that becomes this, equa this, uh, this equation down here. So the change in voltage over time um, relative to this steady state voltage is equal to, um, is, is, let's say just proportional to uh, this exponential decay. E is equal to minus T divided by tau. And so that's why we call this term tau a time constant, because this is a first order differential equation. When we solve it, we get this exponential term. And this term uh, tau uh, will tell us how fast we will relax to this steady state voltage. As an illustration of what this dynamic would look like, if we inject a steady current here, a pulse of current, according to that equation, what we would see is a, is a decay in a voltage term that looks like this. So you see this exponential decay um, to be more depolarized and then more hyperpolarized again when the current turns off. In terms of a real value, uh, tau in the nervous system is about 10 milliseconds. The resistance of cells is on the order of 100 megohms. The capacitance is on the order of 10 to the minus 10th farads. And that gives us a time constant of around tens of milliseconds. So this is a very important property of cells because it tells you how a cell will integrate its inputs by smoothing it with this exponential decay. And it's the reasons why, reason why we don't have megahertz um, uh, response rates or megahertz uh, rate signals in the nervous system because uh, ultimately all of the integration of the signals are limited and influenced by this membrane time constant. Steve, just a little bit of a thought question and not related to the equations at all, but is that time constant um, a sort of product of evolution that allows the cell to maintain, uh, I don't know, signaling homeostasis or something like that? Like why 10 milliseconds is, is sort of the question. Yeah, it's, it's an important question. I would say it would generally reduce this to a speed accuracy trade-off. And so, you know, if, if uh, you have cells that respond to a faster time constant, then they don't have time to integrate all of their noisy inputs. Right? And so if they 
uh, integrate their noisy inputs for a longer period of time, then they may be able to get a Mac ac more accurate measurement of some signal, but then they wouldn't be able to respond as quickly. And so uh, there's probably some control over the uh, time constant like any property. It's a combination of biophysical constraints and then the range of optimization that the system can uh, uh, occur over. But I would say ultimately what we think about is, you know, it's tuned in this region because that's it's sort of a how fast it can operate and still make decisions about the inputs. Okay, so we've talked about the voltages in cells, but how do cells actually create a voltage? Okay. So I mentioned that cells have ions inside of and, and out of them. If we look at this simple experiment here that sort of represents the inside and outside of a cell, if you were to put a high concentration of uh, um, uh, a salt such as potassium chloride into the cell and a low concentration outside. So if we were to have a pore in this membrane, the concentration gradient would just run down as potassium and chloride flow out of the cell or as, uh, as things move, uh, move down the concentration gradient ions move down the concentration gradient. However, if these ions were selected for a, a specific, uh, if these channels were selected for a specific type of ion, such as potassium, okay, then as a potassium ion moved out of the cell, or out of this chamber over here, that would tend to make this, this chamber here, the inside, more negative and this outside more positive. Okay? The more potassium flows out, the more negative this region becomes. Okay? So what happens is an electrical gradient is starting to build up. At some point, the electrical gradient is going to be strong enough that positive charges can't you know, fight their way from negative to positive, and they and they won't flow out anymore. Even though there's a concentration gradient that tends to push the uh, potassium out, the electrical gradient would tend to hold the potassium back in again. Okay. So then, if we were to me measure the a voltage across these two chambers, we'd see that the separation of charge has generated a voltage. So voltage in a cell is created by a constant concentration gradient and ionic selectivity of the pores ion channels in the cell. The concentration gradient are created by um, molecules called pumps, which pump ions either into or out of the cell. Okay. The potential of equilibrium that this system would, um, would reach is called the equilibrium potential or the Nernst potential. Okay. It's, the, it's the potential where there's a, a balanced uh, flux of the, um, uh, of, of the ions in of this particular ion in, in both direction. And basically it's a balancing of energies of the concentration gradient and the electrical gradient. Now it's important to know, you know how to calculate this Nernst potential based on the concentration gradients. And although I won't derive this, uh, this equation, this equation is shown over here at the left. And so this is called the Nernst equation. Okay. So the derivation would come from um, uh, balancing the electrical, um, uh, the electrical gradient from the, the um, difference in ions and the concentration gradient. And uh, if then if you uh, solve that equation, what you get is uh, the equation over here, which is the, um, uh, the gas constant uh, times the temperature divided by the Faraday constant uh, divided by the valence times the ratio of the concentration gradients. Okay? And this will give you the equilibrium potential based on the concentration gradient. At least, at least equilibrium potential for a, particular, um, uh, for a particular ion, if the cell depolarizes, let's say, um, uh, a little bit more in the positive direction, then you'd get a current which would tend to push the cell back into this, back towards this equilibrium potential. If the voltage became a little bit more negative, then a current would flow to tend to push the cell back up to this equilibrium um, potential. So effectively, uh, for, a different, for a given concentration gradient, uh, um, ion channels that are conductive for this particular ion will tend to move the cell towards this uh, equilibrium potential. Okay. So for a factor of a 10 concentration gradient, you get about a 60 millivolt um, uh, uh, equilibrium potential. So a factor of 10 for a monovalent ion would give you a 60 millivolt equilibrium potential. E equilibrium potential. Uh, these are the typical concentrations of uh, ions in the nervous system. Uh, for potassium, which is higher on the inside, sodium higher on the outside. Uh, calcium, which is four orders of magnitude different uh, outside than in, much lower inside. 
but because uh, calcium has a valence of two, positive two, the Nernst potential is, is two factors of, uh, of 60 millivolts. Okay. Typical resting potential of a cell is about you know, minus 40 millivolts to minus 90 millivolts. Okay. So if you go back to an equivalent circuit and think about how these multiple ions will influence the membrane potential. So now instead of this just leak resistor, we replaced this resistor with a resistor and a battery. This battery is one that will tend to push the, uh, uh, the cell to the equilibrium potential of this particular ion uh, with uh, a, um, um, a curve shown, shown here an IV curve, a current voltage current shown, uh, curve shown here. It means that the current this, uh, this uh, resistor battery system will, will generate is equal to the conductance, which is one, of the one over the resistance, times the voltage minus the equilibrium potential. So no current when the voltage is at the equilibrium potential. So this is also called the driving force. This is an approximation. It's a widely used approximation, but this uh, Ohm's law type relationship is, um, is not exactly correct because there are unequal concentrations outside and inside of a cell. And there's an equation called the, the Goldman-Hodgkin-Katz current equation, which you can, you can see for a more accurate measure. But this is, as, a, as I mentioned, a widely used simplification uh, in, in modeling the nervous system. So if potassium was the only conductive ion in the cell, then it would push the cell to this pot uh, potassium equilibrium potential. However, if there was a different ion also with a, with a different equilibrium potential such as sodium, the, the resting potential of the cell would be some weighted uh, average of the two equilibrium potentials. So in this case, the slope of the uh, potassium uh, current voltage curve is much steeper, showing that the conductance is much higher than, uh, for potassium than sodium. Okay. This means that you get a resting potential much closer to the potassium equilibrium potential. So the balance of conductive ions at any one time will control where the potential of a cell is at. So at rest, there's no ionic species that is in electrical chemical uh, equilibrium, uh, except uh, chloride in some cells, which is distributed what's called passively. Each ion has what's called this driving force, which tends to push the cell towards this equilibrium potential of that ion. Okay. Ions move down their electrical chemical gradient in response to this driving force. And at rest, sodium moves into the cell and potassium moves out. And the gradients are maintained with pumps, and they would dissipate over time uh, without energy, uh, because the pumps use energy. Okay. All right, so we've talked about uh, the neuron basically sitting quiet. So how do neurons make action potentials? How do they spike? Now let's make our formalism a little bit more complicated and let the ionic conductances uh, be able to change over time. And they can change depending on the voltage. So the formalism I'm going to talk about is called the Hodgkin-Huxley formalism from the work that Hodgkin-Huxley did on the squid uh, giant axon uh, for which they received a Nobel Prize, uh, figuring out how the action potential is generated not only in the squid, but in, in, all, uh, in all animals. So we're just extending our equivalent circuit a little bit more. There's a few more conductances and a couple of them will change with the voltage. So now our equation, we're just going to extend a little bit more. Again, it's C dV dt, the capacitive current, is equal to an injected current minus this ionic current. But the ionic, the ionic current is now a sum of all of these different ions. There'll only be two ions plus this leak current. Okay. And now in this case, each conductance can depend on the voltage, and it can change over time. Okay. So these conductances are not fixed. So this is just a slight extension of what we talked about before. In the case of sodium and potassium, then we have a, um, a sodium and potassium conductance that changes over time and it can change depending on the voltage. It's multiplied by its own driving force, the difference between the voltage and its equilibrium potential. And then there's this steady leak conductance that also can generate a current. Okay? So again, just a slight extension of our equation that we had before. So to see in concept how this would generate an action potential, let's consider that the conductance is sort of just change as though you we were just twiddling knobs on this cell. At rest, we have a certain level of sodium and potassium conductance. And as I mentioned before, the resting potential is close to the potassium equilibrium potential. Then suddenly 
as sodium conductance increases, which causes an exponential decay uh, to um, have the cell be close to a, the sodium equilibrium potential, here assuming that the sodium conductance is very large. If the sodium conductance turns off, then the cell will hyperpolarize. And if the potassium conductance turns on, the resting potential will come very close to the potassium equilibrium potential. And then once the potassium equilibrium potential turns off, the cell will come close back to where it was before. Okay. This is sort of an intuitive sense of how exactly an action potential works. Now to study in a little bit more detail how the currents would change um, for us, and this is how Hodgkin and Huxley uh, initially did it. They used a tool called a voltage clamp, which is still widely used today. And instead of measuring a voltage across a cell, what it does is create a feedback circuit, which will measure the potential, but inject a current to command the, the cell to, do, to be at a certain potential, let's say 50 millivolts. So this is a feedback circuit that measures the difference between the internal potential of the cell and a reference. And then depending on what that voltage is relative to 50 millivolts, this command potential, it passes the current back in to bring this cell back to 50 millivolts. Okay. So it always clamps this, the cell to this 50 millivolt potential if that's the command voltage. Then, this, then the circuit measures how much current it needs to pass to clamp that cell. And that measure of that current is the amount of current that's actually flowing across the cell because that's the amount of current that the device needs to pass to keep the cell at 50 millivolts. So this is not only a device to clamp the cell at a certain potential, it's a device to measure what are the currents flowing across the cell. These, uh, these days in a more modern circuit, we can do this with a single electrode uh, patched onto, uh, onto a cell with a single feedback circuit. So in experiments, uh, in experiments of voltage clamping a cell, uh, that's, that's illustrated here. A step in voltage uh, at time zero can be made to a few different voltages shown here, minus 40, zero, or 40 millivolts. Okay. If a cell is depolarized just a little bit from rest, what you see is that this current, a potassium current, starts to turn on. Okay. Now, normally when you vo voltage clamp a cell, you wouldn't be able to distinguish different types of currents, potassium versus uh, sodium or any other type of current. What you'd see is just the sum of those currents. And so there are pharmacological tricks uh, or ion replacement ways that people can um, you know, disentangle one type of current for another. Here, we're not going to go into that. We're just going to assume that the different types of currents can be measured. The more depolarized the cell, the more it's clamped to more positive, uh, positive potentials, the more this potassium current turns on. What's plotted here below is the peak current as a function of this voltage potential and what this clamped potential. And so what you can see is that even though you don't get much potassium uh, current down here near rest, the current starts to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, if one were to measure the sodium current, you'd see something different. By stepping to a certain potential, let's say negative 40 millivolts, what you see is that you see a rapid um, uh, turn on of a sodium current, but then you also see the current shut off even though the cell is still at negative 40 millivolts. So this rapid shutoff is called inactivation. Okay? And it's a way that the cell will shut off the action potential. Okay? More depolarization to zero causes more, um, more of a sodium current and, um, and, and, then, and then followed by inactivation. And, but here you see that if the cell is depolarized all the way up to 40 millivolts, the current goes back down again. And all, all that might seem all that might seem strange. What's actually happening is the current the cell is being depolarized very close to the reversal potential of sodium, the equilibrium potential, as uh, or the reversal potential. So plotting the peak of these currents down here, what you see is that at uh, hyperpolarized potentials, the, the current starts to turn on. But then as the current starts to turn on more and more, the cell gets to this equilibrium potential of sodium. And so once the current, sorry, once the cell, as we mentioned before, is at this equilibrium potential, there's gonna be no sodium current flowing. And so that's why the current goes back down again, even though there's lots of sodium channels open. Okay. Okay, so how would these currents be created? So taking this approximation that I mentioned before of a current being equal to the product of a conductance and the driving force, the difference between the voltage and the equilibrium potential, you can see how these both of these curves can be created by the product of this straight Ohm's law-like curve here and a sigmoidal um, voltage uh, activation curve. So here's the uh, curve if there was a constant 
conductance, this IV, this current voltage curve, um, uh, showing the current changing as a function of voltage, a straight line like Ohm's law. However, if we also consider that um, at more negative potentials, the conductance shuts off, and at more positive potentials, the conductance turns on with this sigmoidal relationship. If you take the product of these two functions, then you can get something that looks like this. No current down here, and the more the cell is depolarized, the more the cell approximates this, um, uh, this Ohm's law-like relationship. Similarly over here, um, down in your resting potential, the sodium conductance, uh, the sodium uh, channels are closed. There's no sodium conductance. But as the sodium channel starts to open, the cell starts to get closer and closer and closer to this Ohm's law-like relationship. Okay. So here you can see that this sort of complicated looking voltage current relationship is a product of two simpler relationships, a sigmoidal activation with voltage of these two types of conductances and this Ohm's law-like straight relationship. If you then put all of this together, what you see is that in response to a, a pulse of current, uh, or in response to a synaptic input. Uh, when a cell fires an action potential, these can two conductances, sodium and potassium, uh, have dynamics over time that are shown here. Sodium rapidly, sodium channels rapidly open as the cell depolarized, polarizes. And as I mentioned before, the more sodium channels open, the more the cell depolarizes in a positive feedback loop. They rapidly inactivate, which causes the cell to hyperpolarize. And then the potassium channels activate uh, and then inactivate with a delay because I'm showing the conductance here and not showing that the sodium channels would tend to hyperpolarize the cell because they would cause an outward current as the potassium flows out of the cell. So these are the two main types of uh, ion channels and their dynamics that create the action potential. I'm gonna spend just a minute talking about real ion channels and what they look like. They're very complicated structures. This is a crystal structure of a potassium channel that comes from a, a bacteria shown here. Here you're looking down at the pore of the, of the ion channel here. And here's a crystal structure of a potassium channel from a neuron. So these lines here show the membrane here. And the reason I want to show it to you is to point out the fact that these ion channels not only uh, have interactions with the membrane, they interact with other proteins through these, uh, through these intracellular domains here. They um, um, interact with other extracellular matrix proteins. And if you imagine that uh, if the application of ultrasound is gonna cause some mechanical effect or some thermal effect, all of these interactions are potentially going to be very important. Right? The fact that the cell is attached, the, the ion channel is attached to the membrane or the extracellular matrix, if there's any sort of disturbance or push, then there may be effects that can cause the ion channels to gate or not in ways that we don't fully understand. In general, these ion channels, especially voltage dependent ones or ones that are gated by ligands are poised at sort of right at the place where they were open and close. And it's the little bit of energy from a change in voltage or the binding of a, of, of a ligand that will cause them to change state. And so they're really uh, sensors that are poised to, to make those changes. And if you were to come along and put some other energy in such as thermal energy or mechanical energy, uh, the, the, uh, the effects may be uh, unknown and unpredictable and uh, as to, and we certainly don't know what all of them are right now. Although we may tend to think about mechanosensitive channels or thermosensitive channels or being the main sensors, you know, any sort of disruption might be felt by, by, by many different ion channels. And again, we don't know what, uh, what those effects are as of yet. Certainly not at the, this sort of molecular and structural level. Okay, so I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes on the passive structure of an, uh, the, the, the structure of a neuron uh, influencing the passive way that uh, signals are summed. Uh, I'm going to go through a little through this a little bit quickly, but I want to just point out that cells are not sort of spheres. Okay, so if you take a simplified view of a dendrite, you can think of it. As, uh, as an insulating cylinder with a conductive solution. And you can break it up into a bunch of tiny, tiny compartments, okay? Really, we've only been considering a cell as a single compartment with a resistance and a capacitance. But down the um, um, process of a dendrite or an axon, there's a conductive material and um, called cytoplasm uh, along which current can flow. Okay? And at each point along the dendrite or axon, there's also a voltage voltage at one point, another point, and current can flow down 
uh, down um, uh, the, the center of the, uh, of the of the process. Okay, so we can build this up into uh, a larger equivalent model than we talked about before, where each little compartment has the resistance, it has a capacitance, it can also have many different voltage dependent conductances. So the same equivalent circuit model before you can think of repeating many times and adding the resistance that goes between these compartments. That's really what you have to consider about consider as the, the complete model of a neuron which has um, which can have a very complex morphology. Uh, so each of uh, each of these little compartments can have a membrane current, and there can be a current that flows down this um, uh, um, uh, flows down the process between each of these compartments. Now I'm not going to derive um, uh, how these currents and voltages will interact in the same way we sort of uh, briefly derive a single compartment. Um, but I'm just to point out that, that you can. And what you get is an equation that's shown something like you see here, which is just, again, just a small extension of what I showed you before. So you see the basic building blocks, the C, D, V, D, T, the capacitive current, uh, the ionic current here flowing through the membrane um, with uh, the driving force here and injected current. And then there's this one term here that shows how the current would flow down the process here. So there's a, there's a second derivative here, which basically means that um, the change in voltage over time will depend on the curvature of the voltage over space. So if you were to have a, a peak in voltage here, the voltage over time would tend to hyperpolarize. If you have a trough in voltage over space, uh, over time, the cell would tend to, to depolarize. If, if this, uh, this, these two parts of the equation look familiar to you, this, this, um, these two terms on the left, ignoring the terms on the right, is exactly a diffusion equation. And you can derive it in the same way that you might divide, derive um, the equation for diffusion of, of, um, um, uh, of material between compartments. Okay. You can um, rewrite this equation a little bit um, differently by just by multiplying the, by the membrane resistance. And this is called the cable equation. Okay. So again, you see what we've seen before, the tau, the time constant uh, that we've seen that sets the, the time scale of integration. And there's this one other term that I wanna draw particular attention to, which is lambda called the length constant. Tau is equal to RC. This length constant or space constant is equal to the membrane resistance uh, in a small compartment divided by the axial resistance down the process and you take the square root of that. Okay? The specific membrane resistance is one over the conductance. So this length constant will tell, tell you how easily signals will spread down the length of a, of a dendrite or an axon. The larger the process, the more easily signals will spread and, and also the higher membrane resistance the easier signals will spread. So the membrane resistance is high, signals will spread more easily. If the axial resistance is low, which can come from a larger process, signals will spread um, more easily. So overall, because of the different proportionality constants of the membrane resistance and the, uh, the axial resistance based on the radius, what you get is this space constant or length constant scaling as the square root of the radius. So you can basically really only gain so much by making the process bigger. And at some point, uh, you have to do something else. Action potentials is, is one thing that can send a signal down a long distance. Um, and there's also one important um, property of uh, neurons in the mammalian neuro nervous system that allows signals to spread more easily in axons, and that's myelin. Myelin's are wrap myelin is wrapping of glial cells many times around, um, around an axon. And that wrapping of myelin increases the membrane resistance, which increases the length constant. And it also reduces the capacitance, which means that less charge has to flow on the capacitance in order to depolarize the cell. So both of these properties of, of myelin increase transmission down the cell. All right. So in this last section, I want to talk about uh, a brief overview of chemical synaptic transmission that's going to be a bit less quantitative than uh, than the other sections. Okay, so we've talked about the basic uh, the basic overview that uh, depolarization travels down the synaptic terminal, causes an influx of flux of calcium, a release of neurotransmitter that binds to the postsynaptic cell. Okay? A spike in the presynaptic terminal causes a, an inward current for an excitatory postsynaptic current, as it's called. This inward current, which would cause, be caused by excitatory ions, let's say flowing through a receptor, would cause a depolarizing potential. 
So an excitatory postsynaptic current causes an excitatory postsynaptic potential. And as I mentioned before, depending on this specific type of receptor, if the conducting ion is not a positive ion that has a positive, um, or an ion that has a, a positive equilibrium potential, is if it's an ion that has a negative equilibrium potential below the resting potential, uh, like potassium or let's say like chloride, then this can be an inhibitory receptor that decreases action potential firing in the postsynaptic cell. Okay, some advantages of and consequences of chemical synaptic transmission is, is it's purely unidirectional. It can be excitatory or inhibitory, as I mentioned. There can be a lot of amplification because of lots of neurotransmitter that can be packed in vesicles. It keeps the cells separate, so the, the um, ions in one cell aren't diffusing into another cell, so they can maintain separate um, biochemical composition. Depending on the receptors, which can have all sorts of different gating properties, there can be very flexible uh, time course and, and different nonlinear properties to receptors. Some downsides is that there's an unavoid unavoidable synaptic delay, which might be a few milliseconds across the synapse. And the, since the, the basic uh, units of uh, synaptic transmission are synaptic vesicles, we have what's called quantal transmission. It's sort of discrete uh, and sometimes variable uh, grains of, of information that is transmitted across the synapse. This is a, a rehash of the steps of synaptic transmission that I just showed you, but I wanna show you in a, a little more detail the spatial arrangement of the calcium channels and the synaptic vesicles. When a, cal when a synaptic terminal depolarizes, calcium channels that are voltage gated sense that depolarization and calcium, ch uh, calcium enters and the proximity of the calcium channels to the vesicles are really right next to each other. They create a very small micro domain where there's an elevation in calcium. There are sensors that sense that calcium and the vesicles that are sort of right docked at the membrane as it's called, just sort of waiting to fuse, sense that calcium and immediately uh, fuse. So it's a very, very fast process that occurs. And then neurotransmitter is released into the cleft. Okay. Zeroing in on synaptic vesicles, there are tons of proteins in synaptic vesicles. There are transmitter, uh, tra there are transporters that pump transmitter into the cell. There's uh, proton pumps that keep the uh, vesicle acidic, which is important in um, allowing um, uh, important um, sort of energy, uh, sort intermediate energy source to drive neurotransmitters um, into, the, uh, into the vesicle. There are various um, proteins that target the synaptic vesicle to the membrane. And there's a very important calcium center that I mentioned it's called synaptotaglin. Okay. All these potentials have the Oh, sorry, all these proteins have the potential for, the, for disturbance or change um, uh, by ultrasound. Okay. I want to point out one really important protein, which is synaptic tagmin, and show a little bit more detail how a vesicle looks when it's docked at the membrane. Okay. The vesicle comes right up into the membrane and proteins called a snare complex really keep the vesicle almost there, but just poised to fuse, but not fusing quite yet. Synaptotagmin is the calcium sensor that has a low affinity, which means it has a fast off rate, which means it has a very fast response. So when calcium concentration uh, rises, when calcium channel opens, synaptotagmin immediately senses that calcium and immediately drives the fusion. So once again, the sort of poised at the edge to sense this, this change in energy that's coming from calcium. Um, makes one wonder what happens when there's additional energy source, when a mechanical disturbance. Is it causing vesicles to fuse by themselves? Is, is it disrupting the snare complex? Is it changing the calcium sensor, uh, becoming more likely or less likely to sense calcium? All of these things are potential consequences of ultrasound neurostimulation. There are a couple of important dynamics um, properties of synapses, and I'll, and I'll close with these two. Right, so it's not just a, a static effect where an action potential comes down to a synaptic terminal, causes release of a vesicle or some sets of vesicles, and that signal is always the same. Okay, that signal can change over time. One important way that it does is if too many synaptic ves vesicles start to get released, then there are fewer there, fewer there to be released. Okay. If there's a certain number of vesicles that we can uh, designate, designate with uh, um, a, a variable n, um, and uh, each vesicle has an independent probability p, and the total released is going to be equal to p times n. So in many synapses, if there's a high release probability, 
after a train of action potentials, what happens is for the first one, there's a lot of synaptic release, but then with each synaptic vesicle uh, getting released, there are fewer to be released, right? So the number of vesicles go down. That process of depletion of available vesicles is called synaptic depression. It's an important property of synapses. It, it's thought to be a basis of how synapses in the sensory system adapt to changing signals, uh, the changing strength of signals. But, um, 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 but it's also a way that synapses are not static, they will change over time. The second important property uh, is kind of the opposite of depression. Uh, this occurs for synapses that have a relatively low release probability. And what happens is that over time, the um, uh, probability of release gets greater. This has a different mechanism because with each synaptic, um, with each um, uh, action potential, calcium enters. But the calcium takes some time to get extruded, uh, released, um, sorry, uh, um, extruded from the synaptic terminal or taken up into intracellular stores. So there starts to be an accumulation of calcium. That baseline of calcium means that the release, release probability starts to go uh, higher and higher and higher. So as sort of kind of a, an opposing property of uh, synaptic depression from a different mechanism, calcium can accumulate and then the release probability can start going up and up and up. So these two properties, synaptic depression and synaptic facilitation are an important dynamic property of synapses and synaptic facilitation happens more in low release probability synapses with synaptic depression happening in more high release probability synapses. Okay, so in summary, we've uh, gone through at a, at a, at a very uh, rapid and, uh, and not, uh, uh, I, I won't say superficial, but there's a greater depth in all of these uh, types of uh, processes and, and mechanisms that we didn't get into. Um, so the uh, passive membrane properties come from capacitance and resistance of cells that's uh, generated by ion channels that can gate over time due to voltage. We didn't really talk too much about ligand gated ion channels that can be gated, for example, from calcium channel coming, com calcium channel channels, calcium coming inside of a cell can gate ion channels. Uh, neurotransmitters are also a, a type of uh, neurotransmitter receptors are a type of ligand gated ion channel. We talked about synaptic transmission, which comes from voltage gated ion, uh, ion channels, calcium channels, and the processes of synaptic vesicle fusion. I will mention that there is a great amount of diversity in everything that I've talked about uh, in ion channels and cellular morphology and receptors. And we really didn't talk much at all about circuits, except to say that two neurons can be connected together. And it's the circuits that give the real complexity of how different parts of the brain operate, uh, integrating and combining the excitation and inhibition together. And I'll stop there. Oh, thanks so much, Steve. I think you've really set us up to uh, understand in your future lectures and, and the others on like what the effect of ultrasound will be. Um, I, I had a question for you. I wonder if you could um, tell us, you told us a little bit about calcium at the synapse. Um, just tell us a little bit about GCAMP, like GCAMP mice, how that works. Yeah, well, GCAMP is an artificial sensor that is uh, a modified fluorescent protein uh, coming from jellyfish. And it uses uh, um, a, a sort of a motif, uh, as it said, as, uh, as it's uh, described, of a similar uh, kind of biological calcium sensor. So uh, a cell will bind calcium for um, and sense calcium for its own purposes. And um, uh, this modified artificial protein will bind and sense calcium and, and change its what's called its conformation, sort of changes its shape, and will become uh, more fluorescent when calcium is bound. So that uh, so that important calcium sensor can tell us where calcium is uh, is coming into cells. So depending on where the calcium is localized, it can be in the soma, it can be in the synaptic terminal, it can be inside of a cell, it can be at the membrane. That can tell us to some degree, although not perfectly, what are the levels of calcium inside of a cell. And it's used not only to tell us, you know, what the calcium is, but also sort of as a, a surrogate of electrical activity, right? Often the case is that when cells um, change their voltage, when depolarize, uh, cells have calcium channels, not only at the synapse, but in other places besides the synapse. 
So in general, uh, calcium influx, flux is a secondary measure of activity. And that's what GCAM can, can tell us, uh, indicate to us. It doesn't tell us directly the voltage, but it tells us a cell, a cell is depolarizing because calcium has entered and, uh, and its concentration is, is changed. Steve, I was thinking a, a little bit about, in terms of your depression uh, slides about DBS. So the course has talked a little bit about other means of neuromodulation. Um, can you can you explain how DBS and and uh, short term depression are related? Well, DBS can have somewhat complicated effects. So generally, it's sort of a rapid um, uh, stimulation of a region of a circuit, which can activate excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons. And there can be different protocols of DBS, sort of a, a rapid high frequency, to be able to really uh, activate a cell. Uh, and so the specific mechanisms can be multiple. So potentially there's some effect of synap causing synaptic depression and sort of somewhat paradoxically, even though you're rapidly stimulating a region, you're effectively shutting it down by potentially either, either depressing its synapses. Um, in general, whenever you manipulate the nervous system, uh, or really any biological system, you might expect that there is a compensatory mechanism that will do the opposite of your manipulation. And so we know that when neurons in, in culture and even, even in vivo are made sort of artificially more active uh, in terms of their conductances, then they can have a homeostatic compensatory effect, which starts to make the cells less excitable. And that could also be a potential sort of longer term effect of deep brain stimulation. If you make them too active, the cell senses it's being, it's being too active and then starts to change the ion channel expression so that it becomes less active. And there are potentially many mechanisms from, for deep brain stimulation and it's likely different in different circuits. So in line with that, you could almost say that um, every cell perhaps has a, a maximum threshold of, of how much stimulation it can take. And, and if you go well beyond this, you might start to shut the cell down. H have you ever seen that with any of your ultrasound experiments? Or I'm trying to think back to literature, if, if anyone's seen that sort of thing, like a reversal in their effect. For the if you're doing an acute experiment over time and all of our experiments have been in a dish, then you have to wonder whether the effect you're seeing is sort of a really compensatory effect or whether it's you know, rundown of the prep. You're stimulating a lot and the cell, the prep just might get old. So in the experiments that we've done in both the retina and hippocampus, we haven't really seen strong particular effects, um, these sort of homeostatic effects from ultrasound but we haven't stimulated for longer than hours. So, you know, up to that period of time, we, we haven't seen that. We've seen some shorter term compensatory effects, but those seem to be similar in order to the effects that you see from natural stimuli. So uh, um, most uh, everything, if you, you know, as I mentioned, if you stimulate it a lot, whether you call it a long-term compensatory effect or a short-term adaptation, Right, so you can think about depression as a short-term adaptation uh, of to a large amount of stimulation. So we've seen effects like that occur, but those are sort of on the line of the same order of what if we gave the natural stimulus to the, the neural circuit. And so it, it doesn't necessarily seem that it's different from what would happen for the natural stimulus. Okay, well, I think that's enough for one day. I'm gonna turn off the recording now. <laughs>